John, if I seek the divine, the ultimate foundations of reality, but I'm uncomfortable with traditional religion, what, what can I do? Well, I have another option for you, um, one you may not have considered. It uh, rests on two distinctions, maybe three, depending on how you construe it, but two distinctions mainly and a scientific point or a point supported by science. The two distinctions are these. First of all, a distinction between theism and any other similarly detailed religious claim of the present and a much more general claim I call ultimism, which is just the claim that there is a reality that is ultimate in the nature of things, that is metaphysically, ultimate in value, that is it embodies the greatest value, unsurpassably great value, and ultimate soteriologically, which means that it is in relation to this reality that our own ultimate good can be achieved. Okay? That is a very general claim, which doesn't entail theism, even though theism entails it, and so does every other religious claim. It's, you could call ultimism the basic or the central religious claim. So if you make a shift from theism and other detailed claims to ultimism, that's the one shift that I would emphasize. The second is a shift from talking about belief. And I'm thinking here about what philosophers call propositional belief, belief in response to a proposition like the proposition that there is a God or an ultimate divine reality. A shift from thinking about belief to thinking instead about imaginative faith. Um, people tend to construe faith as though it entails belief, as though it requires belief. I don't think that's the case. I think there's an important distinction that philosophers can help us to see between belief and faith. So if you make the one shift from theism and other detailed claims to ultimism, and the other shift from belief to faith, then a new possibility emerges. Instead of having theistic belief or any other detailed religious belief, you could have ultimistic imaginative faith. Now, I said there was a scientific point on which, uh, well, these distinctions don't rest on it, but they, they come to have more force, or they, they may seem more live to us, vivid to us, if we take account of this scientific point. And that is a point about the very early stage we may be in, uh, in a very, very long process of evolution. We tend not to think about this when we talk about evolution. We think about the past, the deep past, perhaps, but we hardly ever turn around and look at the future and think about how long the future may be. And upon appropriate reflection on the future and on our place in relation to the future and the past, um, I think we will come to see that we are at best at a very, very early stage in the religious life of our planet. So against that backdrop, uh, we're thinking about ourselves as being at a very early stage of religious development, this idea of ultimistic faith, I call it skeptical faith because it doesn't involve <laughs> belief, just imagination, comes to uh, take uh, a more um, interesting shape perhaps, and it becomes a live option. That's the live option that I'm presenting you. It's certainly attractive. There's a lot to say for it. Um, the criticism that one could think of quickly is maybe what you would say is one of its benefits is that it, it is devoid of a lot of specificity. Mm. Devoid of a lot of specificity, but it still has some, and it yes. has enough to, for example, uh, generate um, certain clear entailments. That is, the claim that there is a triply ultimate reality, metaphysically, axiologically, soteriologically, the claim that there is such a triply... Foundationally values and our connection to that's it. That's right. Uh, that claim has enough content to have a lot of implications. And when we think about what sort of religious life we might develop on the basis of ultimistic faith, we can think not only of the generic claim that, that you're referring to as almost devoid of content, but uh, all of the implications it has, which show that it really isn't devoid of content. Well, it's certainly uh, significantly different from a purely naturalistic, physicalistic world that mm -hmm. might be the, um, the, the natural view of science. Right. In fact, that's one of its implications, <clears throat> that naturalism is false. Mm -hmm. If ultimism is true, naturalism is false. And so, by living on the basis of ultimism, or living as though it were true, one is living as though naturalism were false. And, and you can see that there are going to be behavioral consequences. You're going to live differently if you live that way. Um, although there may be overlap with many of the good things that um, a science-based sure. lifestyle might provide. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> people who might have a theistic inclination in terms of the second point about uh, deep time into the future, not mm -hmm. just into the past, would take issue with is that the way you are phrasing this um, uh, 
apprehension of the ultimate puts the burden on us mm. to find it. Right. And many of the religious claims in all diverse religions is that the ultimate finds you. Yes. And certainly. so there's yeah. no need mm. for you to grow bigger brains mm. or evolve. Well, we have to have some sort of capacity for the ultimate to find us sure. you know, in, in the sure. sense of, of our really taking note of it. Sure. Um, and my suggestion really is, or entails, that we may not yet have developed the capacities required to understand this reality. Because after all, it's ultimate. I mean, it's the... It's the deepest fact there could be. Uh, so when we pair that realization with the idea that we're at a very early stage of evolution, we might expect that more growing up, more maturing is going to need to happen before we can expect even to understand any revelation of itself that the ultimate might provide.